Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you. Thank you so much for uh, braving the uh, dark nights to be in this august environment, in this wonderful establishment. My name is Christopher Day, and I have the best job in the world. And uh, it is my privilege to be the publisher of uh, Robert's amazing and enjoyable book. I'm thrilled to be, uh, have uh, been working with uh, Robert on this project for, uh, for some months. Um, and to bring to market a book that is a new genre and it's something which uh, uh, Robert's been passionate about for many years and I do believe that he is um, without any competition whatsoever um, he is the world's greatest living aphorist with an amazing repertoire of over 30,000 original aphorisms. And that is a lifetime's work. And uh, I know that Rob, Robert will be telling us more about that uh, shortly. So please welcome Robert Emerson. Good evening, everybody. For me, this is quite an emotional um, day. And I couldn't believe my, my, I couldn't believe my luck. The competition is huge to get a book anywhere near the bestseller, the top of the bestsellers, never mind before it's almost hit the light of day. Uh, but I have to announce tonight that not only is the book a bestseller once, it's a double bestseller. I wrote this book, Wisdom and Wordplay, which is cheaper than a packet of cigarettes, um, for myself. I mean, I bore you in mind, obviously, but primarily it was for myself. And it, for me, for this book, which exactly encapsulates my vision of what I wanted, ticks three main boxes. The first box, I mean, put it this way, the problem I had was that so many books have, pay, have dust covers, paper covers, don't they, Chris? About 90%, when I went, went to Hatchards and Waterstones last week, about 90% had paper covers. My book is littered, and Deirdre's too with tatty, soiled, torn paper covers. And I thought, well, I don't want that. So it had to be smooth, although it's white. This will be as pristine six months, heavy use, as, as it is today. Because all you do, if it gets stained, you just wipe it. The second box I had to take in selecting the book, I, my dream book, if you like, was that it be small format, which this is. Um, why? Because, again, a problem I, I've had, I, I always find it difficult to find a book, you know, that I can read on the tube, on the bus, uh, without losing my place. And, you know, you get jostled, something happens, there's an announcement, you lose track, then you've got to spend the next between stops on the tube finding where you left off. Now, with this book, you don't. You only have one line to savour, and you can read that in a, in a nanosecond. And then the rest of the time, you can spend savouring it and thinking about it. And once you've decided what you think about it, good or bad or whatever, then you, then you open it any way you like to another line. There's no place to lose in this book. So that was the second box. Well, that's the third box, actually, that it ticked. So all I can say to you um, is that this is my dream book for those three reasons. Ladies and gentlemen, please, uh, a very special welcome to a great and very prolific author, parliamentarian, great campaigner for environmental issues, and an uh, all-round jolly good egg. Please welcome Stanley Johnson. Well, um, jolly nice to be here. Now, I'm going to start this one off. Do sit down. I'm going to start this one off, and Chris, you're going to go on with it. Actually, now, I've got one first question. I've, I've read these aphorisms twice, I've really enjoyed them, you know, great stuff. When you say original aphorisms, do you mean you thought them up? Quite right. These aphorisms okay. for this book, Wisdom and Wordplay, is just a taster. This is one hundredth part, one hundredth part of my, of my total sort of earth. So this isn't a collection of, you know, over the dicta, you know, which you've culled from different parts of the world. It is not. And put together. This is your own invented athlete. Every single one. Everything in my Well, story. I think that is a pretty, you know, remarkable achievement. As you know, we always used to, we, you know, we used to ask a while, and we used to famous last mm -hmm. words, but you have produced this whole thing. <laughs> what is an aphorism? An, an aphorism is a pithy, short, usually one-liner, and possibly with a, with a touch of wisdom in it. I like that. Yeah, it's almost an aphorism in itself. Give us an example. I'm complimented. One example. The absent-minded professor is not so much absent as present elsewhere. Yep, I like that. 
Thank you. Um, it's all really good. And you have a love of words. Why do, where do you get this love of words? Mother's milk? Um, well, are you psyche? <laughs> my mother, well, actually, she was quite psyche, but she, um, she was a wonderful, very gifted linguist, brought up in the, in the wars in Europe, so trilingual. She wanted to pass that on to me, so I, after hitchhiking over Europe, I spent my first gap year in Austria, became bilingual in German, spent my second gap year in Italy, became bilingual, nearly bilingual in Italian, and then I did Russian and all sorts of other things, and got a, a European scholarship. You become trilingual. So, yeah, so that, in fact, the, the quickest way to learn your own language, in my view, is to learn another language, because you're constantly searching for the more juice. Now, I want, you to, I want to ask you, um, you mentioned uh, that you have thought diaries. You told me on the phone you have thought diaries, yes. and these have been a source of raw material for you, is that right? Absolutely. Um, no, I don't know what you mean. Um, no. these, are my, <laughs> these are Stanley, these are my thought diaries. That's what I said, thought no, I, diaries. I, 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 the subtext of your question is, will I explain what I mean? Yeah. Um, what, I mean by, <laughs> what, I mean, what I mean by thought diaries, instead of doing what I did before and um, just saying, you know, I went to Tesco's and bought peanut butter instead of margarine, and looking back 20 years to those, they're so boring. I thought, I thought, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, then I had a play, Commanding Voices, my first, step, my first produced stage play, which had a five-week run in Hampstead called Commanding Voices. And um, when I reread it, there were four one-liners in the play um, that I thought, well, for goodness sake, why do I have to write a whole play to get four aphorisms? Why don't I do the meat? And that was the start, 20 years ago, of my, of my aphorism. That is amazing. And you have these books of, 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 of thoughts, and you were able to mine these thoughts as well, to we find some find some aphorisms which have not yet seen the light of day in a published, in a published way. Well, they, none of them seem like they're all me. They're all original to me. No, they're As in the book? No, not the published one. Well, well, I hope they are published. How long did it take you? So basically what you're saying, it took you years uh, and years long? and years to do this book. Yeah. Years and years. How long to, to publish the book? It took me a week, less than a week, to write the book. But that week, could not have had me write a book had I not done 20 years hard, as you, as you were saying, Stanley, hard work honing my craft. And it's interesting this, because I can actually, as I was saying to Deirdre the other day, I can date my aphorisms by their mm. quality. The That's early one, the, I'm sure you've heard, the early ones need, need work. The later ones, much less work. And I can almost take, say to the year when I wrote it, by its quality, it's extraordinary. And that is, that is the sort of chart of my progress over those 20 years. Do you polish your aphorisms? You know, you all, work the, all the time. All the time. All the time. I never stop. I think that you have done a most fantastic job, and I'm absolutely fascinated by by your your output here. Because if I think of Oscar Wilde, you know, and if you think, you know, the sort of things which he said, "Die, that's the last thing I'll do," or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But you say to yourself, a man might deliver himself of 20, 40, 60, but you have got 300 in here, and, and to hear you speak, this is just. The tip of the iceberg. Now, sorry about the tip of the iceberg. Now, you could say, um, <coughs> it's probably the first person who said it is the tip of the iceberg. It was, it was an aphorism, but no, but that's amazing. You see, I am amazed by this. And what got you, what's put you, is this, is this, has this been your main literary form so far, apart from the play? You no, I'm a journalist, I'm a playwright. I'm the, I mean, I've only been doing this for the last 20 no, years. But what about in terms of published books? Um, I have contributed to one or two books. But okay, but this is the this is my first proper fantastic chaps. I mean, I, I think it's just absolutely wonderful. Look at this. I'm going to open this at random. Oh, do yes. And, and I'm going to read out <laughs> at random. What I'm going to do? I'm going to shut my eyes and put my finger on something. Oh, I do like this one. I really do this one. Cremation stops you taking your secrets to the grave. Yes, good. You see, this is this is a man who's got real. Real style. Uh, may, may, I, may I be allowed to add one to that yeah. on the same theme? Um, a, a happy life is to a happy death is to die for. <laughs> I like I like peeing is relieving. You you like that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I thought that was good. <laughs> I didn't know of your interest in scatology. But... I think it's a, it, it, it's it's a brilliant book, and I want to know how. Um, you have this huge following on, on social media. How do people know that you've written this book? Ah, well, this is a story here. That's a very really good question. 
Um, but it's one of the ones you gave me. <laughs> <laughs> you, would, you wouldn't guess. <laughs> I can write that in one, ask one or two of the ones you Well, it's very, very decent of you. <laughs> yeah. uh, to answer your question, I had no idea that my private hobby would ever become public. Had it become, pub this, had it become public, I mean, I, had I wished for it to go public, I would have started publishing after two, three, four years. But I never published a word for 20 years, and it never occurred to me to do so any more than it occurs to most of us to publish our private diaries. Why would we? This was a private diary, my thoughts. And it's a little bit scary sort of sharing all these private thoughts with, with the general public. And I came to it via two stages, which actually answers your last question about Twitter. Friends, I've been, I can't tell you the pressure I've been under for the last 10 years, including from Giles Brownworth, who sadly is an Edinburgh now, um, and to, to publish. And I, I resisted it. Because it's a private hobby, I didn't want to make any money from it. And so in the end, I ended up going to Twitter because my then agent said, Robert, you've got to raise your profile in the social media, in social media. Mm. And I, to my amazement, they gained immediate traction. And I've now got 33,000 followers on Twitter. And then it was suggested by one of my team, since you asked what my team had contributed, one of them said, Robert, you should. Um, try Instagram. So a few, a few, a couple of months ago, I, went, I, went, I started on Instagram, and to my complete amazement, um, I've now got 14,000 followers. And everybody said, "Well, this is a book. You know, um, aphorisms um, are not uh, are not to everybody's taste. They are classed by publishers at the bottom of the league as reference books." Um, so the challenge for me was to break the mould, which this clearly has. It's a double bestseller over yeah. on, on the night. It clearly has broke. Well, we know because there was a huge delivery to the warehouse. It just went. So we had to get more. So it's obviously going to sell. But I, I thought, well, we'll put, put our toe in the water and see, see what happens. So equally to my amazement, this book also seems to be doing very well already. Would you mind tweeting then, saying, here I am being interviewed by Stanley Johnson, author of Compromat. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, you, if, if you're nice to me, I'll make myself... I have been nice to you. I mean, extremely nice to you. I think it is well, actually, you're, you are. I, I am. I tell you what, I think it is, it is stunningly good, this, you see. Um, humility is to eat the egg that's thrown at you. You have obviously <laughs> spent a lot of time thinking. I have. Less is more, but it takes longer. Yeah, I think, you know, I can see... <laughs> Life is too short to rush. Life is too short for the house. Why else? Yeah. Well, remember, Chris. My name is Charles Hamden Tyler. Oh, Charles. I, I was a trinity with uh, Robert. Uh, I taught at Cambridge for uh, 18 years. Um, I wanted to ask you how many of your aphorisms are paradoxes? And are you interested in paradoxical logic at all? Um, the answer is I love paradox. For me, paradox is to die for. And the minute I spell paradox, I'll work on it, you know, for 10 minutes and get it right. Um, and the answer to your other part of the question is, I would say about probably a fifth of paradox. If you read the book, Charles, you can do a count and let me know that. <laughs> do you have a favorite aphorism um, of yours? The trouble is, I don't, and the reason I don't is because I've got so many that I think should be number one in my collection. Do you know what I mean? And they, they, I can't answer that question directly because they come in so many different categories. And I have a, I, I suppose you could argue, I have a, about 60 favorites in each category. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you ever tried or you plan to do aphorisms in other languages than English? No. Are you being someone English? No. Now, this, this raises a very interesting further question. My good friend, Stephen Bryant here. Stephen, oh there you are, sorry, I can see. Um, Stephen is a translator, and am I right in assuming, assuming, Stephen, that you would never translate from English into a foreign language? Um, that's right, I was only working to my mother tongue. I think that's the answer. Um, and I'm actually wondering, because if, when this is published sort of internationally, as I hope it will be, I think there is a, uh, I put this, there'll be a lot of aphorisms, aphorisms in my collection which just don't translate. They only work in English. So you're, built, 
in the world's number one language. But to answer your question more directly, it follows, therefore, in view of what Stevens just said, that um, I would never dream of writing aphorisms in a foreign language. I wouldn't be anywhere near the level required to do so successfully. Do you remember your first aphorism? No, um, well, it would have been in Commanding Voices, my, my stage play, which you, I, I suppose I could Google it and have a look, but um, it'll be in there. That, those four lines in that play were my first four aphorisms. Mm -hmm. that, from small seeds, oak trees grow. This is, I suppose, the first branch of the oak tree. If I decide to put my foot in the water and follow the turn. The thing that um, uh, amazes me is um, the sheer body of work that you've created. Uh, to, to have 30,000... 33,000 33, um, is, is truly amazing. But something that you don't know at the moment is that um, you're currently being broadcast worldwide, live at this moment, on Twitter. Thanks to uh, Tony. Well, I don't have the password. I can bring it with me. <laughs> but uh, we, we have ways of making things happen. Well, that's brilliant. And, uh, so uh, you're, you are broadcasting to the world at the moment. But um, you know, the uh, uh, to have grown your social media to uh, to such an incredible extent uh, absolutely demonstrates that there is interest and uh, appreciation yes. for this. I mean, um, as, as I said uh, earlier on, uh, first we had the, the literati, and that was followed by the twitterati, and we now have the afferati. Afferati. <laughs> Afferiti. That as well. So, um, this, this, is, uh, this is your first book. What are your plans for, for future titles? Well, I don't know. If this book does take off and goes far, which it looks to be doing, almost before time, rather like Twitter and Instagram did, I'm beginning to get the message, which, um, I mean, I had written those aphorisms, Chris, in, 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 on the assumption that when I die, um, they would be chucked out into the nearest uh, bin, along with my love letters, you know? But uh, I'm, I'm amazed that I seem to be monetizing them now. I still can't uh, quite, quite um, absorb it. Robert, you have um, had a very exciting day. You've achieved um, many, many things on this one day. It's um, to have uh, reached the top selling spot on Amazon, to have reached the world um, at your book launch with the live broadcast, uh, to be surrounded with uh, friends and uh, yes. fellow authors and uh, people who appreciate the great language that we have and the fun that we can have with words. And uh, there's one thing that um, is more important than every, anything. I think it's a love of language and sharing that love of language yes. with other people. And I think uh, you've achieved uh, all of those tonight. And I congratulate you. And uh, I welcome you to do the same. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Lennison. <laughs> what I'm looking forward to now is uh, seeing uh, uh, the, um, what this does to breaking the mold and introducing a new yes. genre um, yes. and uh, really, really open, opening the doors. I'm, I'm so looking forward to the next book and also the impact that this is going to have in the, in the weeks, months and years ahead. I think um, finally, before we move uh, to, uh, to our book signing, I think he deserves an amazing round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Ellison.